with us. So our theme for today is life through the lens of immortality. That's a theme for our symposium today. Now, the philosophy of spiritism offers a profound perspective on human existence because it emphasizes the eternal nature of the soul and its continuous evolution. Spiritism combines science, philosophy, and spirituality, which is the thing that drew me as uh, this white Irish woman to spiritism from when I first visited Brazil. And it offers us a comprehensive understanding of life's purpose and the afterlife. So, with that in mind, we are going to welcome Umberto Schubert, who will be discussing philosophy and spiritism from ancient times to Kardec. Now, Umberto Schubert has been a very busy guy. When we talk about his books, you'll see what we're talking about here. He is currently, not only did he wear green today to honor Boston, I just want you to notice that here, but he's an associate professor of metaphysics and modern philosophy and the co-director of the Research Center in Spirituality and Health at the Federal University of Juarez de Foro in Brazil. Umberto's research is devoted to the metaphysical ground for meaning and purpose in life, which includes a series of proofs for the existence of God in the immortality of the soul. He also looks at the cultural analysis of the relationship between philosophy, religion, and science. Umberto is a member of the Spiritus Society of Primavera, the Brazilian Spiritus Federation, and the League for Researchers of Spiritism. And so we want to give a very warm Boston, and from wherever you are, welcome to Umberto. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to, to be here. And I would like to start my talk or presentation uh, mentioning the importance of having this meeting in the heart of liberty, of modern liberty at least. Uh, well, uh, I walked the Freedom Trail, an essential touristic activity here from Boston, and it is impressive that the Freedom Trail starts with three panels about uh, freedom of industry or work, uh, religious freedom or freedom of worship, and uh, the, the essence of it, the freedom of thought. I think uh, this, these panels uh, are very uh, representative of also a Kardec's, Alan Kardec's mentality. Alan Kardec was uh, very, um, uh, very strong uh, defensor of, of freedom in all of its aspects, and uh, also an enlightened philosopher and thinker that devoted his life to a new understanding of uh, phenomena, basically, um, in, in a very uh, empirical aspect, in, uh, in also from a very empirical uh, approach, uh, that he um, interpreted as being uh, in the past uh, considered mystical or esoterical or supernatural. Uh, as an enlightened philosopher, he wanted to present or to represent this phenomena as being uh, natural, as uh, something that every human being should experience throughout life, and nothing something that uh, we should consider extraordinary or um, marvelous in any sense, but something that uh, through self-discovery and, and self-knowledge we should identify in our own nature. Therefore, obviously, spiritism should not be a cultural product of its time. Uh, of course, every thought, every philosophy is, to some extent, a product of its time. But uh, Alain Kardec di did not uh, mean to have a spiritism as uh, the newest um, particular philosophy of his generation, of his country, France or of his uh, person. He believed uh, spiritism to uh, be um, 
the collection of principles and the understanding of basic uh, phenomena uh, of life, of, of uh, human nature, that we should and could spot in every culture, in every religion, in every, at least, spiritualistic philosophy, or maybe every philosophy on Earth. And uh, his work reflects that quite much uh, throughout uh, his, his books, eh, which are many, not only five. He, he wrote a very prolific uh, collection of, of journals, or the, the Spiritist magazine, about several subjects. Uh, he, he was a poly polymath. And uh, in, in these many writings, we will see that Kardec believed uh, not that he was the creator of Spiritism, but a sort of organizer, of contemporary organizer, of ideas that were evident in Egyptian or Guinean or Chinese or uh, Peruvian culture. And he tried to prove that uh, quite empirically, mentioning uh, parts of um, narratives and, and reports of mediumship throughout the world. I was talking to my great and new Bostonian friends a couple of days ago uh, about the very quick shift in terminology that we used to the contact with the spirits. And this, this shift in terminology has absolutely nothing to do with um, a cultural trend or with uh, the, the spiritist movement, for example, but uh, had to do with the academic understanding of what is uh, empirically going on in, in this process of uh, contacting ancestors or spirits of the deceased in, in general. In the past, we had many different words for that, like channeling or uh, seances or um, uh, psychic abilities and so. But because of the academic research on this phenomena, uh, a new category emerged as uh, very uh, powerful and, and universal in pretty much all countries, which is mediumship. So it is the word we used for a couple hundred years, but it is uh, now also the word that academia universally use to refer to the contact with the deceased, with the spirits. And if you Google uh, spiritism, or not spiritism, sorry, uh, mediumship in ancient China or in early Chinese thought or Taoism or in Vietnam or in Korea or in Nigeria or in, in Peru, we will see that the category is now uh, really universalized. So that was the original purpose of Kardec. Kardec wanted that his terms, the, the, the terms and concepts he was coining, uh, would be uh, universally applicable, if not universally applied. Well, um, therefore, uh, I believe, and I, I have been writing and, and talking about uh, the necessity of addressing Alain Kardec's work as universal, as a part of what in philosophy we call perennial philosophy, or the tradition of a perennial philosophy. I wrote one specific book with this title, trying to present many ideas that Kardec collected uh, under the name of Spiritism, uh, and showing how they uh, appear in, in, in India or in China or in Africa, everywhere. Um, it is also important to uh, remember that if uh, Kardec is talking about and, and presenting laws of nature, they uh, should also be perennial in, in the temporal sense. We should be able to spot these ideas in the ancient times, in the Middle Ages, and so on. And we, we can. Uh, it's not so difficult to find uh, the notions of reincarnation, of mediumship everywhere. We have some key books 
that uh, present this thesis very strongly, such as um, Helmut Obst, which is a, a Lutheran pastor and theologian from the University of Halle in Germany, who wrote the, the, the book uh, Reincarnation, Weltgeschichte, Eine Idee, that's uh, reincarnation, the world history of an idea, uh, that's a, a global idea. And uh, anthropologically, not uh, in theory, but he researched several hundreds of communities around the globe, from Argentina to Alaska, from Mongolia to Nigeria. And uh, he, he came to the conclusion, which was not his original thought, he came to the conclusion that reincarnation is a universal idea. And according to him, to Helmut Obst, there is no single community on earth that doesn't present the notion of reincarnation. Obviously, it doesn't mean that everyone in all of these many communities will believe in reincarnation, but every community presents the idea, they, they conceive the idea. And um, usually without any contact with other cultures. That, that's, uh, that means that these, these notions are uh, native to every culture. Okay. Uh, the, the essence of uh, spiritist philosophy is uh, quite similar to the essence or the birth of philosophy itself, which is self-understanding, self-knowledge, self-discourse, discovery, uh, or Gnoti Se Auton, the famous sentence from the Delphi Temple in, in Greece, which was uh, used, massively used by Socrates. Um, and the Spirit's books uh, shows us, uh, or raised this question, uh, what is the most effective method for guaranteeing self-improvement and resisting the attraction of wrongdoing, a philosophy a philosopher of antiquity once said, know thyself. So uh, instead of a dogmatic or supernatural approach to spirituality, spiritism emphasized that uh, we should uh, mind our own business. <laughs> we, we should uh, take more care uh, of discovering what really is going on inside us. Next. Okay. Um, the Greek were also very concerned. Uh, they were very competent philosophers. They were very concerned with uh, human flourishing, something that uh, is uh, quite a strong trend now. We have a, a center for human flourishing here uh, at the University of, of Harvard, which is the, the global reference for, for human flourishing. And when we read the most recent empirical research on human flourishing, we see, these researchers also see, obviously, that it is quite compatible with what the Greek said about human flourishing. So if you read uh, Cicero, for example, or uh, Socrates, or actually Plato, or Aristotle, we will learn uh, quite a few things about what uh, the best empirical research nowadays is discovering is revealing. So uh, Aristotle, in his very famous book uh, for his son, the Nicomachean uh, Ethics, says that the pleasant, uh, pleasant test is to win what we love. That's obviously a bit relative because we love different things. And Aristotle says, well, the essence of uh, happiness, therefore, or human flourishing, eudaimonia, is to know uh, what truly deserves my love. Now, to separate what we love by uh, instinct or by automatism or because of cultural influence from what we should love because it is eternal and essentially good for us, for the others, for everyone. Um, so happiness for Aristotle, which is a very wise guy, uh, is uh, uh, the result of excellence, and excellence is the habit of great and diligent effort. 
So Aristotle is here explaining 2,300 years ago exactly what Kardec uh, means by evolution. This diligent effort produces patterns and, and habits that uh, prevent us from wrongdoings and foment or uh, produce the good in us, the virtue in us, and the, these habits are what we could call in spiritism evolution or progress. Well, um, of course, not everything is uh, bright in life, and philosophers also noted that there is a lot of sadness and, and misery, uh, which is the main source for the disbelief in God. Since the Greek also, uh, many authors consider that uh, misery or uh, pain, suffering and, and sadness could be evidence or, or proofs of the inexistence of gods. Because if there were good gods, supreme beings, there were morally good, we should never be sad or, or we should never suffer. And uh, according to the notion of self-knowledge, we see that a lot of suffering actually comes from the way we relate to others, we relate to nature, a very contemporary problem, or we, uh, the way we relate to God, like the sense of not belonging, the lack of purpose, because we don't see how we could fit in this world or in this community, how to make uh, myself useful, what's my purpose in life, my particular individual purpose. So uh, not loving anything because you don't see worth in things, you, you don't see uh, the divine fullness in, in things or in people or in specific groups of people. So you have uh, a partial uh, love, uh, a partial contact with reality, excluding something Based, uh, based on prejudice, for example. Uh, the notion of indifference or the lack of will, the lack of the, the power of the will, uh, and the lack of virtue, obviously. Nah? I just don't uh, care enough to make an effort because I don't see the worth in others or in activities, in ideals, or in life, or whatever. Well, um, the problem is, many philosophers recognize that, and especially the medieval philosophers, after the, the revelations of, of Jesus, which Spiritism does not consider a, a sort of, um, of guru or uh, only a, a supernatural being, but uh, mainly as a, a philosopher, a teacher, and a wise and developed spirit that is capable of showing us the, the ways of life, the ways to, to flourish and to be happy. Uh, in the Middle Ages then, it, it was very clearly uh, seen by many thinkers and philosophers that uh, flourishing depends on our relationship with God or the supreme source of reality. But in this relationship, uh, God is always making a very strong effort towards us, while you can see the, the hand of the human being, of Adam, which uh, seems to be kind of lazy, like he's not making a, a proportional effort to meet God. Um, even if God is making a constant and, and dis disproportional uh, strong effort to, to come to us. So uh, that, that's a very wise image because it, it reminds us to, uh, to truly commit ourselves to this change, to this transformation, which is a personal, internal transformation. Well, in the Middle Ages then, uh, we have a, a new understanding of a problem that was not very clear for the Greek or the Roman. The, the Greek and the Roman, because they were intellectualists, they, they loved theory and, and ideas, mathematics, science and so, 
they believe that uh, progress or happiness or human flourishing uh, would depend only on uh, understanding. If I gave you a very, very good talk or a lecture, and if you read the right books, you would be good people. But that does not happen, usually. <laughs> and, and Christianity very cleverly revealed uh, a new aspect of humanity, which is the conflict of the heart. We not only need to understand how life works, how things work, but we also need to master our hearts, which is extremely difficult to make and even more difficult than mastering the laws of nature through understanding and through reason. And uh, we do not quite understand it because it, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not logical. It, it is a force that we have to develop in us, pretty much like an exercise uh, when we know that we should uh, run or, or make some exercise or avoid some sort of food and we, we just can't do it. It is not in our capacity to do it. So we have to develop this capacity, which has nothing or very little to do with just understanding. You have to make the effort, it's a practical effort. So uh, the medievals uh, in, interpreted this sentence from Paul in, in Romans uh, in, in that sense. Uh, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. So uh, that explains a lot about human beings, but it is not uh, uh, logically coherent. <laughs> it, it, it's like something is wrong from the point of view of rational understanding. And we have to, uh, to track our empirical decisions, our practical decisions in time in order to realize that it happens to us all the time but uh, uh, it is very difficult to explain in, in logical terms. Kardec coined uh, a very similar uh, sentence, which is the notion of evolution as a familiarity with the good and the truth, so that the empire of matter is no more. Now, familiarity is not the same as understanding. I can... Uh, with a couple of students, uh, come to a very quick understanding of what is wrong and what is right, but it doesn't mean that these people will have familiarity with the good. That's something that only happens through effort and through temptations and through uh, losses and, and, and failure that will inevitably happen to all of us. So, uh, given a certain amount of time, we will see that something that we understood to be correct, or that we understood to be incorrect, uh, still uh, appeals to us or does not appeal to, to us uh, independently of our understanding. And we really have to, to make the practical movement and effort to develop this familiarity with the good in whatever sense we imagine this good. Could be the aesthetical good. We, we talk to people who hear, to listen to, to very, very good music, and they say, well, it's, it's not appealing to me. I don't see the, the sense uh, of it. I prefer, and uh, then comes a, a horrible music, maybe. <laughs> or uh, I, I go to the museums to this, uh, amazing paintings of fine arts and so in, in the, the best museums and I, I don't see the point uh, of it. I prefer to watch this show on, on the TV. And it is very hard to explain uh, or to convince people that uh, there is uh, an immense worth in, in these artworks. And the same applies to everything, to prayer. Some people just don't see the point and they, they don't feel anything when they pray. And uh, if you do feel something very uh, uh, beautiful and, and touching and delightful, it, it will be very hard for you to convince, to persuade, to communicate 
this amazing experience you're having to someone who just does not have the same experiences. It is something that must come with time and, and great effort and, and practice. Well, um, uh, Thomas Aquinas was the, the Einstein of theology. He said uh, that every being as being, uh, everything that exists is good. That sounds very exaggerated, maybe, <laughs> because we do know some people <laughs> and even some things that do not seem to be so good. But uh, th th there is a, a bit more effort that we should do in order to, to understand what he really means. Uh, for all being as being, uh, just for the fact that it exists, has actuality, and is in some way perfect since every act applies some sort of perfection and perfection implies desirability and goodness. So uh, he's uh, here repeating Plato and Aristotle who said, if you exist, if, if something exists, it has at least the virtue of being there, of existing. And obviously it will have several other virtues. We just have to learn how to see, how to uh, review these virtues to our eyes, how to make them manifest. So uh, Plato was very optimistic, maybe more than Aristotle, and he said that, uh, for example, everything is beautiful. If you don't see the beauty in something, uh, you just have to dig deeper. So at some point, you will see the divine light in that object, in that person, in that act, uh, just because it exists. It is a manifestation of the supreme good. Sounds very idealistic and optimistic, but uh, it, it's really in harmony with a very idealistic and romantic thinker uh, that we know, uh, Alan Kardec. And in another sentence, Thomas Aquinas said, no being can be spoken of as evil. That's even stronger than the former sentence. But only so far as it lacks being. So you're only evil uh, in the sense that you lack some virtue, that you lack some property, that you lack some capacity. When I say you're not smart or that you're not intelligent, I'm not saying that you are something, but you, that you're not intelligent, that you lack a capacity, a power, or a strength. If I say you're weak, I'm not saying something objective about you. I'm saying that you lack uh, strength, you lack power, you lack energy, or something that I identify as force and, and, and capacity. So... Um, because he lacks some virtue, and an eye is said to be evil because it lacks the power to see well. So that's very revealing, but also very optimistic, because uh, Aquinas is here saying that we should correct our lens, our vision, our understanding, in order to see uh, a new world, a world of light, uh, a world of delight, and a world of marvel, and uh, that would be what in Spiritism we call the religious aspect. The aspect that is a, a, a consequence of philosophy, uh, a consequence of the empirical investigation or the scientific investigation of spiritual phenomena, we call usually mediumship, and uh, this consequence, the religious aspect would be the glorification or the adoration of all things just uh, because they are full of virtue, they are full of good. If we are not in this point, progress is somewhere in the middle of the way. <laughs> well, uh, happiness then for the medievals, and I'm here quoting a very uh, extraordinary person, St. Louis uh, philosophy and theology 
professor, uh, Eleanor Stump, which I consider one of the most intelligent and wise uh, persons on earth. Uh, she, interpreting Thomas Aquinas, she says that uh, happiness is a sort of longing for afterlife. In, in reference to the book of Job and why God allows suffering in general, Aquinas stressed that human beings are lazy to cultivate virtues and eager to embrace vices. So God applies suffering medicinally, I guess. So um, that's a, 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 an attempt to explain why suffering exists, why so much pain, why so much sadness in the world, why we uh, have in some experiences the impression or or we are convinced that these uh, existences are not worth and that they are um, so full of suffering that they uh, should be uh, eliminated or that they should not be conceived uh, at all, should not be created in, in the theological sense. And uh, she reminds us, in reference to Thomas Aquinas, that uh, that's a, a consequence of our extremely materialistic vision of life because we understand life uh, from the physical point of view and we are always calculating profit and, and prejudice considering only the physical life and the bodily life, we may uh, judge some lives as essentially devoted to suffering while uh, afterlife is eternal even in, in other understanding not only in this in spiritist understanding of afterlife. Well, uh, another very important um, pillar of spiritist philosophy is the notion of the first cause or God, which is not uh, developed by Kardec, but it came from Aristotle actually and Plato uh, throughout the Middle Ages where the, the term first causes were coined and uh, it, it became very uh, transparent through the philosophies of uh, Baruch Spinoza, uh, um, apostatized Jew, and uh, Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, the popularizer of the notion of perennial philosophy, who said, Spinoza, that God is the first in the sense of being the primary cause of everything. So, uh, nothing is really understandable unless it is tracked or rooted to the first causes. And uh, Leibniz added that God is the supreme intelligence and whatever God does is best possible choice so that reason glorifies every creation without the need of religion. That's a very important part because here Leibniz is saying uh, if you rationally analyze the origin of being and the origin of life, you will inevitably worship God in a purely rational sense. So uh, even if he appreciated and respected revelation and scripture and, and so on, he believed that every human being possessed the, the power that reason actually possessed the power to review uh, what would be the religious consequence of this uh, investigation of life. So uh, religion here is not something that just happened and we have to believe, uh, but it is a, a consequence of rationally thinking about the world. Well, that's obviously exactly Alan Kardec's perspective. Well, then uh, in the Enlightenment, uh, which is uh, a very important movement also here for, for, for Boston, uh, we, we have Benjamin Franklin and other examples of enlightened uh, thinking uh, obviously applied to this context, to, to the political and social context of, of Americas, but in, in Europe it was very uh, pretty much directed to 
the investigation of nature and the, the support, the philosophical support to, to sciences and also to the scrutiny of religion, to uh, a new evaluation of religion and what religion uh, could have to, to offer to every human being independently of culture. And in this time, uh, the notion of natural theology was developed uh, very strongly, which is the, uh, very similar to, to what Lyman says, the understanding that uh, there is a, a part of religion that has nothing to do with revelation, but that comes to us naturally as a human understanding explores uh, life and, and human nature and, and nature in general. That's a picture of Immanuel Kant, an author that I suspect Allan Kardec read uh, frequently, maybe, because many terms and concepts that we see in Kardec's works, they are also uh, a bit before in, in Kant's works. Uh, I wrote an article about them, uh, which has the funny title, Kardec and Kant, not only the K in common, because they really have uh, very similar philosophies. And Alan Kardec studied with Pestalozzi, a German-Swiss um, professor that uh, had a very uh, good philosophical library. So we know that Pestalozzi read Immanuel Kant with great appreciation, and it is extremely unlikely that Kardec wasn't influenced by that. Also, we know that Kardec was uh, very uh, perfectly fluent in, in German because he translated a massive uh, work from French to German. Uh, by experience, I know it, it's not so difficult to translate uh, foreign language to your mother language, <laughs> but to, to do the opposite is quite hard. It's, it's much harder. And uh, if he translated hundreds of works of literature, poetical works, philosophical works from French to German, uh, he should be quite familiar with the German language. And it is very, very unlikely at this time that he did not uh, read any of, of Kant. Well, um, at the moment, we also had the advancement of science, the notion of natural laws that we see very clearly in Kardec works. We had very uh, important figures that prepared the, the condition for uh, uh, a more universal thought at, as Kardec's, such as uh, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing and, and Fenelon, uh, who were champions and advocated religious rationalism. Lessing, for example, was the first to develop a purely rational argument, not a religious position, uh, on reincarnation. He was the first modern author to, uh, to defend the idea of reincarnation as compatible with Christianity and also uh, as a, a product of rational thinking. Uh, Fenelon was a Cartesian philosopher and also a priest, a Catholic priest, who uh, also uh, developed some key ideas about self-investigation and self-knowledge that are very clearly present in Allan Kardec's work. Well, then we have uh, my speciality, Romanticism. I dedicate my life to understand this very crazy thinkers. And uh, more recently, I started considering Alan Kardec uh, romantic too. Uh, that's a very vague term because uh, the specialists themselves disagree about what is romanticism <laughs> and um, who actually is a romantic thinker or not. But uh, we can mention just one essential um, characteristic of romantis, romantics, which is the notion of uh, an absence, uh, the, 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 the search and the pursuit of something that we, not, we don't quite know what is. 
So uh, contrary to what most people think, it's not sentimentalistic, not necessarily, but uh, it uh, wants or it, it seeks for uh, an expansion uh, to non-rational fields. It's not an attack on reason or against, not against reason, but it is uh, the demand for um, uh, a, a broader research and a broader consideration about human life in general. Uh, it renewed some core Christian ideas, but then uh, at the moment in a more universal perspective, and we can mention a uh, key female author, which is Madame de Stahl, Madame Germanie François Necker de Stahl, uh, who uh, spoke a lot about uh, mediumship and reincarnation in her books about 50 years before Allan Kardec. Uh, and uh, she mentioned this capacity to communicate with the other world and uh, the notion of reincarnation as two very typical romantic ideas. <clears throat> well, in some romantic pictures, we can see that uh, human beings are uh, either absent or they are underrepresented, and uh, nature or the mystery of life uh, overcomes and uh, uh, is uh, emphasized in uh, instead of humanity, which is not the case of the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, we see human figures uh, as the central part of any painting, but uh, the Romantics uh, created a new way of seeing the world, a new way of understanding the world, which is centered on, uh, on, on nature or the infinity or the idea of plenty, of abundance, of um, of life surpassing or uh, not being contained in human reason or human understanding. <clears throat> that helped many thinkers, or also several artists, uh, to think about the occult, about the mysteries, the unsolved mysteries of life. And we see in, very typically in Fuseli paintings, the notion of ghosts or spirits or entities from nature also that come in dreams and in uh, alternate states of conscience that we do not uh, identify as uh, wake or typical states of conscience. Well, then we have uh, French spiritualism. Also, uh, for, for Kardec readers, you should identify all these names in, in Kardec books. Now we have Felicité de la Mene with this very important essay on the indifference in matters of religion. It was written about 210, 220 years ago. And he said, well, our generation is the worst generation ever because people do not believe in anything these days. <laughs> and uh, people uh, just uh, mind their, their business, their own business and their uh, material lives and they have no ideals, no passion, no, no true deep sentiment. Well, uh, uh, Chateaubriand uh, wrote The Genie du Christianisme, which is also a very, very important book who, which universalized the notion of Christian principles and uh, helped uh, changing the, the current mentality uh, of Christianity from uh, a religion to maybe a universal philosophy. And then uh, in the Anglo-Saxon culture, not only here, but also in, in Britain, we had uh, Dr. Elliotson in the University College of London, who was working with magnetism, and he was a materialist, and he believed that magnetism would be a normal, natural force that would come from the body. And he has some co collaborators, such as William Wood and others, more from, from the humanities, who um, conceived the possibility that these uh, new forces 
could uh, be exactly the same that we see in myths and religious literature, such as the Bible, but not only the Bible, because if they are universal uh, principles and patterns, we uh, should spot them elsewhere too. Uh, Isaac Post, very important uh, American, created the term medium, and it seems to be Emerson who created the, the term spiritism. That's uh, interesting because we usually say or believe that uh, these are Alan Kardec terms. They are local. <laughs> well, uh, then we come finally to Kardec the thinker. Kardec's philosophy is pretty much a synthesis of what I just said before. So he uh, has God as the fulcrum of all his thoughts and we can see that in the very good and clear introductions that Kardec write uh, for his books, like uh, the Book of Spirits, but also the Genesis. Uh, and Kardec ded dedicates the introductions and the first chapters of his books to God, understanding, and he says that frequently, that uh, without uh, an expanded notion of God, without a more philosophical notion of God, without a more universalist and less cultural, less uh, um, dependent or anthropomorphical notion of God, we cannot uh, make sense of this phenomena that we are now calling mediumship or uh, the other principles that uh, make uh, spiritism philosophy. Well, uh, the notion of immortality of the soul or the communicability between the words, the, the material and the spiritual words, are consequences, corollaries or expressions of God's love. Because God uh, loves universally and does not restrict his teachings to a specific group, to a social, cultural group, uh, these notions necessarily have to be spread throughout the world. Also the, the notion of reincarnation and the notion that the moral laws are universal. We could make a, a transcultural analysis of these moral laws uh, and we will find them everywhere instead of the anthropological, cultural notion that um, moral law is uh, a product of one or other specific group. Uh, the notion that science is also a, a reflection of this possibility of a common and universal understanding of reality, of nature. Uh, the notion that mediumship is uh, uh, a super Wi-Fi or a, a universal capacity to connect everyone to, to everyone, uh, making or realizing in practice the universal solidarity between souls. So no soul is separated from all creation. Everyone is connected. We can always connect and, and have empathy and, and have compassion and also interact with anyone that exists. Well, uh, this is a brief summary of spiritist philosophy, as you may have noticed, an attempt to show that Allan Kardec was a true universalist, and uh, I would be very glad to receive questions and to talk more about the texts. Remembering I am a writer, I'm not a speaker, so <laughs> I, I believe to be fairly competent in writing, but not so much in speaking. So uh, because of that, I thank you for your patience.